Today, I'm delighted to welcome Rob Reiner, Professor of Organisational Psychology at Queen Mary University of London to the Digital HR Leaders podcast. Rob, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome you to the show. For our listeners, could, could you start by giving a brief introduction to yourself, your career background, yeah. and maybe, maybe your, your experience in evidence-based uh, practice as well? Sure, sure. Thanks very much. And thanks for having me on the pod. It's great to, to be able to talk to you and your w viewers and listeners. So yeah, as you mentioned at the start, I'm a professor of organisational psychology at Queen Mary, but I'm also, as an, another role, I'm associate director of research with the Corporate Research Forum. And my background is as an organisational psychologist. I've been an academic for 30 something years. Uh, so I'm quite interested in, in practice, in organisational psychology practice and HR practice. And about maybe 25 years ago, I got very interested in evidence-based practice as it applies to both organisational psychology and HR. So although I've had these interests in particular areas like the psychological contract, well-being at work, ethnicity, I kind of felt quite a long time ago that what academics were doing was producing this research no one was paying any attention to it. It wasn't their fault in particular. So I felt more important for me anyway, my professional kind of development was rather than churning out more and more and more research is actually saying, well, how can scientific research as one source of evidence be used to help inform practice? So yes, I spent a lot of time thinking about that and working on that. Yeah, it makes sense trying to bring academia and practice yeah. closer together. And before before we get um, into the into the detail, Rob, I think it would be I know you've, you're, a, as you said, you're a huge advocate for evidence based practice and it's a big focus of your work. I know we've really yeah. in HR itself, you know, you and the Corporate Research Forum have been studying this since since 2011. Could you explain a little bit about what evidence based practice actually is? Sure. Yeah. So in general, what it is without before we get into HR in particular, it kind of emerged maybe 30 years ago in medicine to sort of tackle a problem which all practitioners have. And I think this is a really important point. Evidence-based practice can sound very, well, what's that got to do with me? It sounds a bit technical, sounds a bit like science, whatever, whatever. Sure, that is part of it, but it's to tackle a fundamental problem. So I think all professionals, whatever profession you're in, essentially want to do, I guess, two things. You want to focus on what's important for your clients, customers, business, whoever it is you are serving as a professional, and once you've identified that, you want to do stuff that's more likely to work and to be effective to help resolve whatever problems or issues or opportunities the client or customer or business has. This is a widespread problem. So although it started in medicine, there's a whole host of professions who've now tried to adopt it as a way of doing those two things. So from, from policing to policy making to architecture to finance to social work to education, all these different professions have adopted something very similar in terms of this model just to try and do those two things. And essentially, it's about improving the effectiveness of what we do as professionals. That's really its point. Which which makes a lot of sense, really, doesn't it? You know, we want to be doing stuff that's going to have an impact. I, I think it does. Yes, I, I do. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and again, if you talk to any profession, including my own or HR, you find quite often that when you say, well, what have you been doing this week? What are your priorities? It's not uncommon for people to really say, well, what I'm doing is stuff. I'm doing stuff because we need to do stuff because the stuff is what we do. And if I don't do the stuff, we won't, the stuff won't get done and I won't get rewarded. I won't hit my targets. And then if you ask the other question, well, what's this for? What's the problem? Is it going to work? People are a bit less clear about that. So it's a, I think it's something that really affects a lot of jobs and professions that people feel they're going through the motions, very busy, lots of activity. But is it actually helping? So, you know, in a, I mean, I'm very simplifying it here. It's a way of, you know, a, a practice that helps you focus on the right problems whatever, for whatever stakeholders that you're trying to serve. You know, is that customers, people in the business, leaders, employees, whatever. And then it's it's something that helps you prioritize um, the, you prioritize the, the, the work that's actually going to potentially have the biggest impact. Yeah, it is. And I think although, I mean, you said oversimplify, I think that's kind of it. And one of the challenges I've had for some time in describing this to people is they kind of say oh is that it i go yeah that is it <laughs> uh and on the one hand i think certainly in hr and other professions people are quite used to sort of silver bullets magic solutions they're looking for something wow and you go this isn't wow this is actually quite simple but if you actually want to be more effective in your role in your profession this is where we need to start not looking for exciting new shiny things so in a way it is very simple but it's quite hard to do i think yes 
yes, because there's so much noise yeah. and, and, and external pressures and, and distractions going on. Quite, yeah. So, um, but yeah, and it's good that something's actually quite simple at its core because then hopefully it's yeah. easier for people to, 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 to kind of bring it into the, to, to, to their work. Yes, yes. What about, so let's, what, let's look at evidence-based practice in HR and obviously that's where really sure. we're going to focus on for, yeah. you know, for, for this podcast. Without stating the obvious, what, why is it important? You know, and what does your research tell you about how widely or, or maybe how, how it isn't mm. uh, being used today? And, and maybe because you've been studying this since 2011, it'd be great to understand how, how we've progressed as a, as a function or not um, during that time. Yeah, I mean, as, as we all know, HR has had a long-standing kind of credibility issue, fairly or unfairly. And in fact, I would say you could look at other functions within a business and, and say they have those credibility issues too, like marketing or whatever. But it has this credibility issue. And I think historically, it's dealt with it in a number of ways. Uh, one is and the whole kind of seat at the table thing. I think one way it's dealt with it is by trying to do what the business asks it to do. So to be order takers. And I'm simplifying it. It's not quite fair, but kind of the business partner model. So where you say, what do you want? The business, say to the business, what do you want? They ask for this. You go, great, we can do that. And that to me really doesn't get you very far in terms of imp not only improving credibility, but also truly helping the business. Because as we know, the things we get asked to do in HR are not necessarily of value to the business, the things people want us to do or they like or they think are cool, not the same stuff. So I think it's responded a bit like that, but more recently, I think it's got into the idea of using data and evidence in terms of people analytics uh, and using, particularly using internal organizational data. So there's definitely been a shift. And I would say in, in all the years I've been looking at this, the bigger shift to me is now it's very hard to, for me to find an HR practitioner, an HR professional who doesn't agree with the idea that HR could and should make better use of data and evidence in its work. And that is a shift. I think when I first started talking about this, I think, I mean, this is not quite right, but if somebody once described me as the most unpopular man in HR, I don't think I was. I mean, obviously that's really cool, right? But I don't think I was. <laughs> um, but what they're getting at is, I think there's a sense in which some time ago, we, if you say to any practitioner, you're not making very good decisions, you're not using the best available data, a lot of things you're doing are missing the point and aren't effective. One response to that is, is kind of, how dare you? Uh, we're, we're good, we're professionals. Duh, duh. But more recently, people go, yeah, you know what, we could do better. That, that's been a kind of big shift. So I think HR... Uh, needs evidence-based HR or something very much like it or or certainly people analytics too and I think it's reached a point where where my sense is people feel now this is just something we have to get on with we've spent enough time feeling inferior feeling we're not respected we're not really pushing the business forward this is a way of kind of doing it so I think evidence-based HR is just something that you know I mean, I'll say whose time has come. I thought it came like 25 years ago. <laughs> whose time is still coming and maybe we've just reached it now. So it has shifted, yes. Yeah, and we're going to talk a little bit about the differences between evidence-based R and people analytics a bit later in our conversation because I think there is a confusion. Some people confuse the two a little bit and whereas one may complement the other, it's it's. Uh, but we'll get into that conversation. I, I, I was looking at the report, the latest report that you'd um, written for the Corporate Research Forum which I think is available to Corporate Research Forum members, but I know you've been highlighting some of the findings from it in, in a number of articles that you've been publishing recently. Um, just a couple of questions that I've taken from the executive um, um, report, um, Rob. You know, what are, firstly, uh, let's start with Elysium. What are the principles of, of evidence-based HR? Yeah, so th this is, I think this is a, a very important question to start with the principles, because I think sometimes when people look at the models, they're kind of thinking, what the hell is this? What is this? You're trying to make me make a structured decision and what is all this evidence and what's all this data and what's all these sources of evidence? And the, to go back to the principle is really important. So examples I sometimes use are when we make personal decisions in our lives. So if you say are uh, moving to a new country, if you're really thinking of completely changing career, or if you're planning a really complicated family holiday, there may be six or seven people 
they all want different things you've got limited time limited budgets you want to really understand you, you know you're not going to make everyone completely happy but you want to make decisions about where to go what you're going to do that's going to kind of get most bang for your buck and please most people so obviously what you would do is ask different people what they wanted you really think about it you look for destinations you look for hotels or activities whatever it was that was going to make sure at least most people who might have very different views about what they want were going to get some of what they liked and if you just think about that as just a, one example of a personal decision that, where the outcomes are really important, the principles are in there. Because what you would do is firstly, you would really try and understand what the issue was. What do people really want? You'd understand that before you started looking for solutions. And then you start to look for what's going to work. So you think about that, a sort of structured approach. The second thing you do is you would really try to think about the quality of the information you were getting. So you might go on TripAdvisor and check out a beach, a hotel, a resort. And obviously, sometimes TripAdvisor is trustworthy, sometimes it's not so much. Sometimes a hotel is trying to tell you stuff because it wants you to book the hotel, not because it's necessarily that accurate. So it's a structured approach. Uh, and the third thing is sort of looking at the quality of evidence and also it'd be using multiple sources of evidence. So typically, with a really important decision, you don't just look at one source of evidence. You don't just look at TripAdvisor or a guidebook. You say, OK, the guidebook's telling me this. Let's look at some pictures. <laughs> Let's look at the Wikipedia page. Let's look at so multiple sources. So those three principles are really the principles of evidence-based practice in every field. And they weren't handed down on tablets of stone from God or something. They're just what we tend to do anyway when a decision is very important. So I'll just repeat it. It's taking structured approach, multiple sources of evidence, and thinking about the quality of the evidence and only paying attention to the best quality. So these principles sort of underlie evidence-based HR as well. Yeah. So I suppose it's the difference between going to senior stakeholders in a business and asking them what they want and then just going and doing it. Um, and then but asking people what they want, why they want it, what's the problem they're trying to solve and really trying to get really underneath what the, what the issue is. And if you can really get to the issue, then you've got more chance of, a, OK, so what's the data we need? Maybe you need to test that and understand the extent of that problem. Is it a problem in this part of the business? It's a problem in other parts of the business as well. And then the solution is more likely to be able to solve the actual problem rather than what they want. Uh, exactly. Yes. And you mentioned stakeholders there, and that's something that quite surprises people. So when we talk about what sources of evidence to be used within evidence based HR, there's, there's four. One is your internal organisational data. And that is typically where I guess people analytics tend to focus. So it's, it's what's your data from inside your organisation. The second source of evidence is scientific evidence. So if you're dealing with the problem around well-being or, or diversity and inclusion, what does the scientific evidence say about what that problem is and what you can do about it? The third source is, as you said, stakeholders. So what do stakeholders believe is going on? What do they think the issue is? And their views are part of, a key part of that whole evidence picture. And the fourth area, which actually quite surprises people, because I think evidence-based HR is not a very clear term, is its professional expertise. You are coming into this situation as an HR professional with your own views, with your own opinions, with your own experience. And that is important. That is a source of evidence and data. But like every source of evidence and data, the question is, is it reliable? Is it trustworthy? And is it relevant to the problem? Or put it another way, you're expected to bring your professional expertise. That's partly what you're being paid for, if not wholly what you're being paid for. So but it, should, it needs to be incorporated as another source of evidence in just the same as those other three. So I think the one of the again one of the strengths of it and one of the unique things about evidence based HR is to think an evidence based practice is that it explicitly says multiple sources of evidence for purposes of triangulation and contextualization are really important. And an, an example we can all relate to is you may do lots of analysis of different kinds of data. You go and talk to two or three managers who explain what's going on. You go, OK, let me check that out. And you go, they are right. The data was pushing me one way. But actually now I've talked to other people, I've gone back to it, I can see actually their perception is actually is what's going on. So the idea that say this cross checking triangulation, multiple sources is, is really core of evidence based HR. And I guess it's I mean, you mentioned academic or scientific evidence, you know, the classic thing that, that we look at a lot in in HR in people analytics is attrition, because, you know, and people have all different ideas as to why people might be leaving an organisation. Obviously, data will tell you internal data will tell you to some extent but scientific data and there's been a hell of a lot of studies done on this will tell you that 
people probably leave because they feel there's a lack of development, for example. Yeah. Um, oh, and that's what our data tells us as yes, well. So exactly. it, it's, 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 it's that sense check, isn't it, really, the, of, of using that academic evidence? It is a sense check. And if you, if you, yeah, with attrition, if you had like a very big meta-analysis of the, 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 you know, the most important predictors of, say, attrition in this case, uh, and, and actually the studies, I mean, not all scientific evidence is good, as you know, as we all know, but if it was a good quantity of good quality evidence, it would tell you something about what's likely to be the case. And again, it might confirm your internal data or it might contradict it, which is also pretty interesting. So why is it in your context, these predictors from scientific evidence are not playing out? I mean, is there something wrong with your data? Is it is the scientific data not relevant? But that process of working out what's going on is incredibly useful in terms of making the best use of your internal data as well. Now, that's really, really interesting. Rob. I'd love to hear, and I know you've got some examples in the in the CR, CRF research, you know, what can you share some examples of evidence-based uh, HR in practice? Because I think that really helps bring things to life for our, for our listeners. Yeah, I mean, let, let's stick with the, I think the attrition is, you know, is a very kind of, uh, I guess it's always been it's one of the kind of chestnuts of HR, isn't it? But attrition is quite a nice example. So what you might do, and the evidence-based HR always starts off with a perceived business issue or perceived business problem. So the starting point would be you or your colleagues or the senior management team says, oh, we think there's an issue here with attrition. Okay, that's your starting point. The first stage is to really understand, well, what is that issue around attrition? So again, going over those four sources of data, it may be, well, what do we know are the what causes and effects of attrition from the scientific evidence? What does our professional expertise tell us about what might be causing this? Uh, what does our data tell us? And this is again where people analytics is absolutely key about who is leaving, where they're leaving, when they're leaving. Uh, and also, you know, the stakeholders, what the managers believe is the reason for this, or do they see a problem? And you really look at that first to identify the problem. And crucially, does that matter? So does the attrition matter? Matter in what ways? Matter to who? Matter to which outcomes? Once you've got to grips with that, and if there was a particular issue, and typically with attrition, there's never just one problem, it's multiple problems. Some of those problems are important to the business, some of them not so important, but focusing on the ones that are, you then say, okay, stage two, let's follow the same process, multiple sources of evidence to say, what can we do about this? Is it salary? Is it to your point? Is it about development? Is it about, uh, you know, competitors are offering something else, it's not about salary? Is it to do with there's just a whole new market, you know, labour market opening up for what's actually causing it? And then you get some idea about what can we do about this? What, what are the interventions that might work? So it's this two stage process, multiple sources of evidence, really stick with what's the issue and then and only then moving towards the solution. And again, I think apart from the multiple sources of evidence, the model we've tried to develop really separates out these two parts because, you know, I think everyone can relate to the experience of people spending not much time on identifying the problem because it's hard and it's difficult and it causes conflict sometimes and it's confusing and very much wanting to move on to let's let's action this, let's do something, back to doing stuff, let's do some stuff, let's intervene. And typically, you know, people spend way more time on that and not enough time on saying, what is the business issue? Have we kind of bottomed this out enough to help us think what do we need to take action on? So that it's this two-stage process is really crucial as well, I think. Yes, that, there's that classic quote that's uh, attributed to Einstein about how much, if he had an hour, how much how much of that hour would he spend on the problem rather than the solution? And I think if something like 55, I mean, I'm, I may be getting this wrong, 55 minutes on really understanding the problem and five minutes on the solution. And I think maybe we don't do enough of that. We don't, and, that, and that's partly why I think uh, evidence-based practice has evolved to be a sort of structured way of doing it, because it's, it's quite difficult for all of us to stick with the analysis of the problem. And I think understanding that is hard, it is difficult, it is confusing. Typically, the first hunches we have turn out not to be quite right, or it's more complicated than we thought, or it even turns out it isn't a problem, which is a bit annoying as well, when we spent so much time thinking it was a problem. So I think really think about how can we hold and stay on that kind of problem opportunity diagnosis part of drawing a line and say only then can we go on to it. Because also, of course, the other issue here is you get, you know, the art of solutioneering where people like the idea of a particular solution, like we needed, I don't know, we need a talent development programme. 
or management development program. I like that. I've seen my colleagues do it elsewhere. It's really cool. Let's do that. And then you retrofit the data to justify the solution. And again, you want to draw a really strong line. So we're not even going to talk about any interventions or solutions yet. Let's just really bottom out what seems to be going on. Yeah. No, it makes a lot of sense. Otherwise, if you don't spend enough time on the problem, you may be trying to solve the wrong problem. You know, and then that's just a waste of everyone's time and energy, isn't it? So No, I was going to say something else I've always been, I guess, it drives my interest and other people's interest in evidence-based practice, including in areas like medicine, is exactly as you said. It's the idea of waste that, that in medicine, HR, policy making, government, all kinds, people just spend a lot of time, effort, energy, emotional energy doing stuff, which actually in the end is just probably or could be completely unhelpful if not harmful and i think that sense of let's not you know we've got all got limited resources and time let's use them really well let's spend time really trying to use what we can can do let's make sure it has as much impact as as it can and i think as you said those four sources of um of yeah. data if you want to call it um are, are you need to use all of them because it's very easy and again i've we've i've seen this in the example of companies around the world they're maybe their people i know 16 will just look at the data yes um they'll think okay we've got a problem with attrition they'll go away they'll try and come up with a solution to solve that problem they'll go to without even talking to the business yes they'll go to the business and the hr business parts and say look at we've been developing over the last six months it's it's really accurate blah 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 and they say we don't have a problem with attrition we don't have enough attrition yes exactly um and they, you just waste time solving for things that, that just that just, just aren't there so um so i yeah. think as you said those mixture of those four areas and I, and i guess depending on the problem that you're trying to solve you might need external data as well as, as scientific evidence as well absolutely so, yes yeah yeah it's it's uh it kind of makes a lot of well, it would I, I like saying it would make a lot of sense to me but but it does make a lot of sense as well and i think a lot of what you've described robbie is, is some of the stuff that we see in the work we do at Insight 222, people analytics teams doing, we see them mm. employing these sorts of practices, not always, but employing these sorts of practices. And that leads on quite nicely to, um, I know it's a, an element of the research, but it's an article you published recently, which uh, created, you know, a fair, a fair, a fair few comments, shall we say, um, on the difference yes. between evidence-based HR and people analytics. You know, what, what are the differences between the two? But maybe more importantly, how can they complement each other? Sure. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the reaction to that article is quite something. I mean, for a little while, I thought I'd become the most hated man in people <laughs> analytics as well. Uh, so it produced in some, not in you, I have to say, David, but it produced in some quite kind of negative reaction. Because I think people, people were thinking I was saying, that evidence-based HR is better than people analytics or people analytics is rubbish. Of course, I wasn't saying that. And I think what I was trying to say is there are differences. Why should we think about those differences? Because I think a lot of HR functions and some people analytics team, they say, oh, we're doing people, we're doing evidence-based HR, we're doing it. And I've been asking this question for years and say, okay, can you show me what you're doing? And it's extremely unusual for any people analytics team to be doing evidence-based HR. I'm not saying they're not doing great work. I'm not saying it isn't important, but it's something different. And I think if people think they're doing it already, they're just going to ignore it. So I think the purpose of that article is trying to say, look, they are different. They're not, you know, they're complementary, as you said, they're different, but you're probably not doing it or you're doing some of it. You could do more of it. So what are the differences? I think the first difference is that evidence-based practice, as I mentioned, evolved outside HR. It doesn't mean it's better or worse, but it means the origins of it are a much broader, I guess, attempt to solve this problem I said at the beginning for every practitioner, every professional. Are we doing what's important? And once we've identified that, are we implementing things that are most likely to work? So that is a fundamental process. I think a second difference we've touched on quite a few times is sources of evidence. So of course, People Analytics does use some external data, maybe like some benchmarking data. Of course, it primarily looks at internal organizational data not so i would say i've never heard people i think steve explicitly say they incorporate their own professional expertise or that of the hr team yes they have a chat to people great and that's helpful but it's about being a bit more explicit in incorporating that a lot more and or similarly talking to stakeholders again it happens but i would say in my experience it happens most by kind of yeah we chatted to these people it's kind of incidental it doesn't mean it's not useful but the difference is evidence-based hr it's really important you teach treat each of those sources of evidence as potentially equally important. 
So it sounds like sometimes it says focus on internal data and as an afterthought or just as a supplement, yes, we'll, we'll get some other source of data as well. So that's another difference. I think focusing on a really structured approach to decision making, what's the issue? Is it a problem? And if it is going on to the second stage, what can we do about it? Is again something that people analytics doesn't necessarily do. Some teams do it. And I would emphasize that I haven't come across many examples, but sometimes I have seen a people analytics team who is basically doing evidence-based HR. They don't call it that. They don't maybe do it all very sort of uh, in, in an explicit way, but they're more or less touching those four bases, taking the structured approach, watch this, see what we can do about it. And I think the, the next difference is a really explicit approach to saying, here's some data, whatever sources is, is this data reliable? Can we trust it? And is it relevant to what we're trying to do? Again, that can happen. But also what can happen is a people analytics team, like any functioning organization, has a lot of data, and so it tends to want to use it. From an evidence-based HR perspective, no, you don't use it. You only use it if it's trustworthy, reasonably trustworthy, and if it's relevant. So I think that there are some key kind of differences there that means, to me, people analytics is an absolute part of this evidence-based HR picture, but if you supplement it with these other sources of evidence, I think it'll be much more effective. And to take a really extreme example, it might be, and again, I know people, this is, this is caricature in people analytics, but my analogy is often where, if you think about, say, going to see a family doctor, you go to the family doctor and they can use multiple sources of evidence both to understand what's going on with you and if there is something going on with you, what they can do about it. At its extreme, people analytics is a bit like that doctor only looking at diagnostic tests for you, like blood tests, uh, CAT scans, MRIs, they're only using your internal data. It's really important, but they are ignoring their professional expertise, they're ignoring medical science, and also they're ignoring you as a stakeholder. They're not even asking you to talk to them. And that's a, that's a sort of extreme version, but sometimes some of the people and this stuff I've seen is a bit like that doctor only looking at one source of evidence. And I think that illustrates his limitations because we all know as a patient, we would want our doctor to use their expertise. We would want them to use medical evidence. We want them to talk to us as well. And if they didn't do those things, we probably would think they're not a very good doctor. So it's a key part of it, but it is only part of it. It's really interesting, Rob, because I, th I, think, I, think I think you're right. I think that maybe of those four sources of data you talked about, I think people analytics teams, all people analytics teams are typically good at looking at internal organizational data. And then some are better yeah. than others that maybe looking at the other three elements yeah. of it. And I think what's really interesting is some of the research that we've done at Insight 222 into what makes a successful people analytics team. By success, we, we determine that they say that they're, adding, they're having an impact on the business, whether that's financial yeah. impact, whether that's positive impact on the workforce, whatever. So it's the outcomes that they're producing. And it, what's really interesting is those companies that are doing it well, number one, are interacting with their, their stakeholders. They're understanding what the business problems that their stakeholders have got, and they're using consulting skills to really unpeel what the real problem is that they're trying yeah. to solve. They, interestingly, the, the people analytics teams that are adding value in terms of the skills they have within the team. So I guess this is the professional expertise bit. Yes, they have consulting skills. Yes, they have data science skills, but actually increasingly have behavioral science skills as well. So that organizational psychology piece is in there so interpreting, yes. I guess, the data to, to, to as it relates to humans, you know, how people behave, which I guess is where your professional expertise mm. comes in. Um, and then in, and again, actually, we didn't we again, I know this is more anecdotally from talking to people like Thomas Rasmussen and the work that he that he's that he did at Shell a few years ago and at National Australia Bank. Sure. Yeah. That understanding what the scientific evidence says as well. You know, so you can at least compare that with what the data is saying in your own company. And, and as you said, if it is completely different, that probably gives you the question, well, why is it completely different? So at least you're going to test that and, yeah. and look at the, the, the sources yeah. of data that will help you to taste that. So it's, it's really interesting. So maybe just like HR is, is slowly going towards, you know, as a function towards evidence based HR, maybe people analytics as a sub function within HR is, is, is doing the same. And actually, again, two different studies and I don't want to jump to conclusions, but 
it would appear from from what we what we're doing the 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 team analytics teams that are having the most impact are the ones that are closer to using some of the evidence based HR techniques. Yeah, I, th- I think that and that makes a lot of sense to me. I think if you're in it, it, in a, in a it, is it contradictory? But in a way, if you as a people analytics team, you can make much better use of your own organisational data if you follow a structured process, separate out problem solution, and take multiple sources of evidence. You will strengthen the value of both your skills as a people analytics team and the value of your organizational data. So again, some people sort of sometimes feel like it's detracting from it or it's weakening it. I would say it's the absolute opposite. It's strengthening how that data can have value because it's incorporating these other sources give you a much uh, stronger, clearer, broader evidence picture of what's happening. So I've, I've got a question here and I don't I think maybe it's, it's not necessarily the right question. It's so when should HR apply people analytics or evidence based R? It's probably both, isn't it, really? But um, but I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think I think it starts off again. The evidence based HR process starts with the business problem, the business issue. Now, obviously, with people analytics uh, and other ways of gathering data and evidence, sometimes it's just background descriptive stuff. You're looking at trends, things are going up and down, like a dashboard, oh, that looks a bit weird, let's investigate. So there are sometimes just things in the data that say that's something to look at. However, that doesn't mean it's a business problem. So I think the key thing is to start off, when you would use people analytics, I think, and uh, evidence-based HR, is, is you would only use it, I think, when you're pretty sure that the thing you're starting to identify is a really, really important thing for the business rather than, oh, it's interesting, oh, it's cool, let's take a look at that, or I like that, or that's weird. Okay, that's all right up to a point. But if none of that links to the organisation, then it's not, not the right moment you know, to do that. So I think it has to start with the business problem. And also I think there's just times in HR, again, like in any profession, where it doesn't make sense to do it. If it's not important, and sometimes you are just doing things because of compliance either compliance with legal requirements, compliance with you know the senior management team, they are your state senior stakeholders. If they're just saying, we want you to do that, yes, sometimes you just have to do that. Uh, and so you wouldn't bother trying to do evidence-based practice then. Also, I think you wouldn't start to try and do this after you've already implemented a big program because it's frustrating to implement a big program and then, then work out what's the evidence for the problem and what's the evidence for this program being effective. Let it go, uh, to, to, yes, to, to quote Frozen, let it go and start when th- new things are appearing or with a new project. So I've often, you know, I've found in my experience work with HRT, sometimes they do do it retrospectively and then they get very frustrated. Why did we do that? Why didn't we do this? And what was the point of this? And a lot of self-justification. That's OK. OK, wait till there's something big, important coming along. Now try this process. Now use the people analytics. Don't retrospectively, yeah, and you can evaluate, of course, and evaluation is important. But again, to me, you would only evaluate, it's only worth evaluating something if you're really clear what is the issue and why did you think this thing was going to work and how do you think it's going to work. So in fact, evaluation is part of the evidence-based HR process. It's not something you do at the end when you've already made all these decisions quite badly. You do it as part of the whole process. Yeah, you almost need to decide how you're going to evaluate the success, you know, as you're working through the process rather than at the end. Oh, how are we going to measure success? I was just going to say, it's, it's not, again, it's, it's a sort of cliche, but uh, it's really not, I've been contacted many times by organisations who want help with evaluation. And often they're quite big, quite expensive projects. And in many, many cases, it's too late. It's just too late to evaluate. There's no, almost no point. Okay, you did this, you don't know why you did it, you don't know what working means. You can try and work it out now, but... Just let that go and remember for next time. Remember for next time. So when you when you put a learning program in place next time, think about how you're going to measure the success of that learning program before you actually press go on it. Yeah, and also why you're putting it in place. And why you're putting it in place, yeah. Because that will help you determine what the maybe what you should be measuring as success. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Rob, I mean, I think you've just said that not, not everything in HR needs to be evidence-based. So what guidance would you offer to, to CHROs and HR leaders that are looking to incorporate evidence-based HR into their functions? I think uh, that's a really important question. It was something we asked in the, the latest CRF report. And one of the things that came out, which I thought was really interesting, is the role of leadership. So I think for CHROs, 
again, they, you know, in my experience, you've got a lot more experience than me, but they vary a lot in their attitudes towards data and evidence. Some see it as a kind of almost necessary evil. Uh, others think it's absolutely fundamental to the function. But what is key is that for the people we spoke to who have developed this, is they say leadership is really important. Are you asking a lot of questions? When people are planning stuff, do you ask them where the evidence and data are? Do you ask why a lot? Are you happy to stop doing things? To say, oh, you know what, we were doing this thing, we've done it for three years, but actually it's making absolutely no impact. We should just stop because we don't know why we're doing it. It doesn't seem to work, let's just stop. So the role of leaders in encouraging the whole function to question what they're doing and to not come to any decision-making process or meeting without thinking about data and evidence seems to be absolutely key. So leadership is really important. And I think for any CHRO, you know, they have to look inside themselves without getting too psycho babble about it. But but is it are they comfortable with this or not? And if they're not, well, why is that? And should they get more comfortable with it? And what do they think their role is as a CHRO? What do they think the purpose of the HR function is? I mean, to me, the purpose of the HR function is to help the business. And it will do lots of other things to get there. But if that's really what you want to do, then I can't see another way of doing it without using more data and evidence. What's the problem? What can we do about it? So I think even make keeping it, as you described, very simple, then if you think that's important for you, for your function, and to help the business in that way, then what are you going to do about it? And so the idea of leadership is, is really important. Sorry, just to interrupt you, Robert. It's leadership and it's role modelling, isn't it? It's it, which... Yeah, and, it, what's, and that's what's really interesting is, um, so we did another research study at Insight 222 last year into companies that are building data-driven HR functions or basically building data literacy in their HR professionals. And actually we found one of our key findings was that you need the CHRO and the HR leadership team to role model. So not just say it's important, but do it themselves. Um, and that's not, and as you said, it's not easy for some CHROs or, or senior HR leaders. It isn't. And, and I think that, you, sorry, I missed that. It's absolutely, part of that leadership is also role modelling. And I think the role modelling, and I think this is the reason some people may be a bit uneasy about it, they might, a senior leader might think, oh, the people on the 16, they're the people that do, I don't know, multiple regressions and multi-level modelling, whatever it is. Fancy to, I don't know anything about that. And that makes me feel like I'm a bit mm, sort of, mm. you know, excluded from that. Well, you're not because... Your senior decision maker, you don't have to know how multiple regression works. What you what you do, you can do is ask really good questions, mm. question the quality and relevance of the data, think about the decision making process, and ultimately say why do we think this is important for the business. You don't have to be a statistical expert to ask those questions and to get answers to them. So I think part of that role modelling is constantly sort of asking, yeah, asking really good questions and pushing your team to go a bit deeper into stuff and think a bit more critically around data and evidence of all kinds. So, and sorry, you, you talked about leadership. Was there anything else? Uh, so leadership, role modeling, what, what else? Leadership, role modeling. Yeah, so a couple of people who, who've done this, I think quite effectively, said you have to be, if you want to get into this, you have to be prepared, uh, not just a leader, but I'll say kind of many levels in an HR team, is you have to be, humble and prepared to have your beliefs and views really really challenged in that it's quite uncomfortable we all all of us believe certain things particularly in hr because we're humans as well we all believe stuff about what we should do what we shouldn't do what helps motivate people what, what does treating people fairly mean what causes attrition we have these very strong beliefs and it may turn out that the data and evidence we get sort of supports those it may not and often it doesn't so giving up cherished beliefs you have about various HR practices and the way things work around HR is also really important. So that is, a, you know, I think, again, I think everybody finds that difficult, but it's quite a key part of it. If you're going to go into this, you have to sort of be prepared to say that thing I thought was true probably isn't probably doesn't work this i know this technique this personality test this training this way of dealing with diversity i really believed in it but actually it's not working it's not doing anything so you know so that's that's another one that came out um another thing that came out and it links back a bit to leadership and and i guess role modeling is the idea that this again i know this is a debate within people analytics as well is that this should not be something 
that you have a little unit within an HR function that's the evidence-based HR unit. This is a way of thinking and approaching everything that HR does that's important and you have to understand for the business, whatever level you're at, I think, is because it, it, it's a way of working as a group of professionals. So what you don't want to do is hive it off into a little group of brainiacs and imply only some people can get this who are really smart. It's not what it's about at all. So I think that's that's another thing that came out quite strongly from the report. Yeah, really interesting. I mean, we'll get onto that particular about how you infuse it across the whole HR function in a minute. But I, it just uh, it, it, as listen, this listening to you there about the leadership and role modelling, and you know we've we've actually you know we've worked with a couple of HR leadership teams who recognised that they needed to upskill themselves, and they almost needed to upskill themselves before they ask the rest of their function um, to 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 do the same. And that 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 leads to the next question, Rob, which is around how do you, as you said, don't just make this some clever unit of brainiacs in you know in a si- hi- siphoned off part of HR that just supports leaders and and the HR leadership team. How do you infuse it across HR? What what are the skills that HR professionals should be focusing on to develop their capabilities to be evidence based as well? Yeah. So so yes, this this is the sort of yeah very key question. So it's one thing to say. Here's a model, here's an approach, it makes sense, I get it, we should be doing it, fine. There's all kinds of reasons why we're not doing it, fine, but how can we, we start to, to actually doing it? And I think there's a number of things. First is, you said, you asked me right at the start, what are the principles? I think remind people the basic principles, what evidence-based practice means. Remind people about what the purpose of HR is. I almost think you could, you could have a big thing on people's screensavers or on the wall of an office saying, is this helping the business? Is this helping the business? And how do we know? What's the problem? What are we trying to do? So just inculcate that sense of everything we do should be helping the business. If it's not, we either have to we have to get retrospectively say, well, is it? What's the problem? What's the issue? And if it isn't, just stop doing it and focus on the, the problems. So that, that that becoming an everyday everyday kind of way of thinking. The principle is important, and I think the the other thing, and we're trying to do this at the latest report in CRF which is by the way accessible to anyone if it's soft gated so you can get a copy if you want or you can contact us if you want to know more is in it there's a toolkit and this toolkit I developed because for this reason exactly people sort of get it they kind of want to do it and they just can't seem to get started so this toolkit has a lot of techniques in it uh, frameworks models checklists that really I hope and we're still working on it we're developing it to get people going with this. So for example, just a small example, there's an HR fad checklist we developed. So lots of, we're inundated in HR with practices and techniques and new exciting stuff. Is there a quick way you can say, let's just think about this. Are we doing it because the cool kids are doing it or are we doing it because it really has identified a problem which which you really will, we know it's gonna help solve. So you can quickly check, there's 12 questions. Is this thing that's coming over the right and likely to be a fad or not. So that's one thing we're doing. Another thing we're doing is a very simple way of checking the quality of data and evidence from whatever source it is. So you can literally sit down, there's six point six questions, or is this data probably reliable or not? Another thing is the model itself, which said this two part model, each part has six steps and you can actually follow it. And we give the, give examples of the kinds of questions you can ask. So these are all very, practical scaffolding to put around the process of doing it because I think if you don't do that I think some people get it straight away and they can just run and do it most of us need supports scaffolding protocols checklists just things to make it all a bit kind of easier so I think the toolkit is one thing the other thing we've developed is an audit tool and the audit tool does two things one is it looks across a team about the extent to which you are engaging in what we describe as evidence-based HR behaviours. So the way this works is you get individuals within a team to complete it first. It's pretty straightforward, like rating on a scale from zero to 100% of the time. It might be for important business problems, what percent of the time do you look across multiple sources of evidence, like at least three? Do you do it 100%, do you do it 50% to try and get a sense of how much of this people are doing and then once people have filled it individually, then try and get a consensus score and discuss why people might see it differently. So that audit source says, okay, it's an HR function, which would include people analytics too. These are the bits we're doing pretty well. 
These are the bits we're not doing so much of. And again, there's guidance about how you can start to do more of those. So it tests your behaviours, but also you can use a similar framework to test your practices. So you might look across, say, motivation, reward, talent, well-being, diverse and inclusion. You can get your major packages of, of activity and actually go through them and say, OK, here's one thing we're doing. It's, I know, unconscious bias training, whatever it is in the case of d &I. What is it? Why are we doing it? What's the problem we're trying to address? How good is the evidence for that? Why do we think this is likely to work? So again, I mentioned at the start, you shouldn't do big retrospective stuff. This is more just a, a health check, a health check of what you're doing now to give you a sense of, well, this seems quite solid. This looks like it really is going to be making a difference. This we're not so sure about, so we should investigate a bit more. This probably yeah, you need to think about doing something completely different. So it's both a, a sort of audit of practices and an audit of behaviours. So hopefully the toolkit and the audit together gives you sort of say this sort of practical steps to sort of get going with it. At the moment, I think for a lot of HR functions and HR professionals, there's still a bit of a gulf. I get it. I want to do it. But how can I start doing this tomorrow? Well, hopefully those tools will enable you to do that. Where, where can people find those tools or information about those tools, Rob? Yeah, so you can email me uh, to get hold of them or CRF. And if you go to the CRF Evidence-Based HR Hub, Knowledge Hub, there's links there to both the tools and the frameworks uh, and also, yeah, other ways you, you can get hold of them, yeah. Right, great. And I think what we've really been speaking about a lot today an evidence-based HR is an enabler for this, I think. You talked about HR historically being order takers. Um, you know, we definitely yeah. may be part of the journey why we, why you'll see your research is finding that evidence-based HR is is more prevalent than it was and maybe my, the reason why people analytics is also more prevalent than it was and maybe is more yeah. focused on the business than just on, on HR is this kind of shift HR is making towards from being order takers to being a strategic partner to the business. But it's almost we can't be a strategic partner to the business unless we're focusing on helping the business achieve its outcomes. Um, one of those, of course, yeah. that, you know, certainly as it relates to, to people, is that actually having a great employee experience and a great culture because we hope that that's going to drive business results as well. But we do need to investigate that and understand what drives business results from an employee perspective. But it's almost that the evidence-based HR piece is is helps HR become that strategic partner. And, and we need to employ these practices to do that successfully. Yeah, the, I think so. And something I've seen which, which sort of quite disturbs me, both in the case of people analytics and evidence-based HR, is when I've asked some practitioners about it, they, they describe both of those things as, they often use the word justifying. It's justifying what HR does. And you're thinking, is that the wrong way around? I think it probably is. <laughs> you know, you shouldn't be justifying what you do. You should be doing stuff that, that makes that makes a difference. And even the term justifying sounds quite sort of defensive. I've done this. I'm going to justify it. Well, you shouldn't have to justify it. Just do stuff that addresses the business problems, more like to work, and tell people whether it works or not. And if it didn't, it didn't. Fine, great. Move on. Do something else. Find another issue. Find another solution. So I think it's there's something both... I guess with people on this and evidence-based HR, there's something on the one hand that is very simple about it, uh, without getting too highfalutin. There's something that's also, I think, quite profound about it, because it requires most of us to work in ways we're not quite used to. So we're not used to this, for example, this process of stopping and thinking, I'm not going to think about a solution. I'm really going to try and understand the issue. Most of us are not used to that. Most of us want to go straight into solution mode because it's comfortable, it's nicer, it's easier. And, and it, it's a simple thing, but it's difficult to do, as I said before. So I think it's uh, a real challenge for HR is, is to start simply trying to do some of these things sometimes. And crucially, remembering that it's not about making perfect decisions. There's no such thing. It's about getting insights and helping you make better informed decisions. I think if people think there's some perfect answer, there never is because we're not dealing, we're not doing crosswords or secudos or maths. There isn't an answer. There's no answers. There's stuff we can do that's more or less likely, we hope, to work. There's no answers. 
So I think the more we can say it's not about perfection, it's about making better informed stuff. And I'm sure that happens with people analytics too. The people that's going to give you an answer, of course it isn't. Um, but the insight bit is really important. In the end, crucially, it's also it's humans that make decisions, not evidence and data. We are responsible. We are doing it. We're using this stuff to help us do it better. Yeah, that's, that's really good. And I think that leads nicely, Rob, to the to the last question actually so this is a question we're asking everyone in this series of the of the podcast you know and again please apply your ev evidence-based hr uh, lens on this one you know what are the top three ways you believe that hr could play a pivotal role uh, in creating a thriving organizational culture well <sighs> what is culture <laughs> <I'm gonna say. laughs> um, i might bypass the word culture okay but i'll say it in just well just because personally I find it a bit unhelpful but I think in terms of what it can do to sort of help organizations be more thriving mm. I would say that the top three things is kind of one thing sort of packaged together which is I think within HR and within management there are some very old ideas like job design where you think about what do people need to do or role design what do people need what do we want them to do why do we want them to do it have they got the resources? Are they getting feedback? I think there's a number of really basic things that somehow along the way got slightly lost. And I think to create any kind of thriving environment, I think it, there's some really basic stuff. Do I know what people want me to do? Do I know why I'm being asked to do it? Do I feel that what people value what I'm doing? Those kinds of basic principles. And I think getting those write as much as we can it seems to me the key thing to creating a thriving environment now maybe to do culture it may be a cultural thing it may not be but i think there's some real fundamentals there so sometimes i feel we in hr need to go back and look at some of the stuff you know not because old stuff is better but from the 50s 60s 70s where people really were thinking about what is work what gives it meaning what how do people perform better what does good performance do all those kind of really basic questions that you know were answered not brilliantly but reasonably well at the time some of the stuff that came out of that was really important so i think reflecting on yes there's all kinds of new stuff there's ai there's virtual yes absolutely but some of those fundamental psychological behavioral principles i think have not you know will never probably change so i think going back to some of those is really important and making sure that all the fancy stuff we do the techniques the policies the practices the interventions bear in mind that these basic things that we need to get as right as we can and then i guess using evidence-based hr to to really validate yeah what does give people meaning yes and, yeah and, and what impact does that have on on them and 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 their performance yes you know, and, the, and the business exactly yeah yeah great well rob i've really enjoyed this conversation i knew i would because we did have a we did have a coffee a few weeks ago didn't we uh, um we kind of previewed what we were going to talk about yeah me too thank you um, so thanks very much for being a guest on the Digital HR Leaders podcast. C can you let listeners know how they can contact you um, do, if you're on social media as well and, and find out a little bit more about your work? Yeah, so I'm on LinkedIn and my name's relatively unusual, so I'm very easy to find. I'm on Twitter and you can also contact me via the Corporate Research Forum webpage. You look there, you'll find me, you'll find my contact details there as well. So yeah, so please... Uh, if you're interested in evidence-based HR, I post quite a lot of stuff on LinkedIn. It doesn't always make me the most hated man in uh, people <laughs> analytics. Uh, but I've tried and post a lot of stuff about scientific evidence, other kinds of evidence, and thinking about how the HR function can become more effective. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, yeah, have a look at some of the stuff I post there as well. And you're not the most hated person in people analytics, Rob, or the most hated person in HR. Thanks. So you ask, good, you ask good questions, you ask the right questions to make us really think about what we're doing. And I think that's really, really important. So... Uh, so thank you for sharing um, some of your research um, with, with listeners today. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. In this series, we will be speaking to a range of senior leaders who are pushing a data-driven and digital HR agenda. Make sure that you subscribe by your podcast app of choice and also via our YouTube channel for free and regular interviews with the digital HR leaders of the future.